in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A very brief summary of the why of a retreat. Why does an individual make a retreat? There are a variety of reasons. I am going to suggest four. You might have another reason altogether. One reason why we might make this retreat is because we want to withdraw. We need both a spiritual rest and we also need a physical rest. We have been involved, we have been active, we have been working, we have been in the field. Now, we want to go back, we want to retreat, and we want to look at things from a distance. Another reason is, in imitation of God, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 to 3, where after God's work of creation, God rested because God wanted to go back him. God wanted to retreat. God wanted to look at things from a distance. So we also, because we are made in the image and likeness of God, we also, like God, retreat because we are more than our work. We are more than our activity. Activity. We are more than what we do. This is the prime reason why the author of Genesis would have God retreat and also is the reason because we are more than the external, we retreat. A retreat might also be made, like in the case of Jesus, before important decisions. At his baptism, Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17, Luke chapter 3, verses 21 and 22, Jesus receives an invitation. And that invitation through the voice from heaven is to be both beloved son and to be slave. And Jesus has to decide. It is an important decision. And so Jesus goes into the desert. Jesus retreats. Jesus withdraws in order to make a discernment, in order to make a decision. Is it his closeness with God which will determine his decisions? Or... Is it his closeness to the world which will determine his decisions? The two kingdoms are placed before him. The kingdom of God, which he is invited to proclaim, and the kingdom of the world, which also lures and invites. So before important decisions can be made, we also, like Jesus, retreat. And the reason why I would like to believe, no matter what the other reasons are, a person must make a retreat or a person does make a retreat, is to meet the person of Christ. We are privileged 
because the religion that we follow is the following of a person God made visible. When we talked of God before Jesus, it was merely a theological concept. When we look at the image of God in the Old Testament, by and large, it is a God who is I am. And Jesus makes this God personal so that the terms that he uses are terms that we can understand. That is a term like father, a term like mother, a term which we are familiar with. And therefore, we enter into this retreat to deepen our relationship with the Lord. And if we have not met him, to encounter this Lord. Because then, the disordered tendencies that we might have, the attachments that we might have, and all of those which move us away from the kingdom and our focus on the kingdom will disappear because we have attached ourselves to the Lord. So I do not think that one must make a religion to get rid of these. They will be got rid of if we attach to something else. Because then there is no place for them. Because now we are possibly not attached to the Lord. There is a lot of place for the disordered tendencies, for the inordinate attachments. And they take away our time. They take away our energy. Being attached to the Lord. And like him saying, my food and my drink is to do the will of God. Then the disordered tendencies drop automatically. Those disordered atten attachments drop automatically. And that's why let us focus on meeting the Lord. And so the question is, what are the qualities required when making the retreat? I am going to suggest five of the many qualities, but I consider these as the most important. And the first quality is that of generosity and large heartedness. In the spiritual exercises, Ignatius suggests five hours of prayer. According to me, the five is merely a metaphor for this generosity. And even though because he is writing, he specifies the times when one will pray, I would still like us to believe that he wants us to go beyond this five and so, I suggest nothing at all. I suggest you pray as much as you want to pray, as much as you believe that the Spirit is directing you to pray, as much as you can pray. But it is also true. And Jesus is explicit about this in Mark chapter 4, verses 24 and 25. Pay attention to what you hear, Jesus says. Pay attention to what you hear. The measure you give will be the measure you receive. The measure you give will be the measure you receive and still more will be given to you. In other words, God's generosity knows no bounds. If there is one of the wonderful qualities about God, besides many, many others, it is God's generosity. God keeps giving and giving and pouring and pouring and never stopping. However, the receptacle that I have will determine how much I receive. So, it is not that God 
is not generous with me. It is that the receptacle of my heart is so small, is so puny that God can only pour in that much because only that much can be contained. And that's why when I talk about generosity, I include large heartedness. It's not merely generosity, but also large heartedness. And I like to believe that the prayer of Ignatius, which we said last night, and I would like to repeat today, and I think you can repeat asking God for this great Lord, teach me to be generous. If you can recite this prayer as a mantra, as the disciples went to the Lord and requested him, Luke chapter 11, verses 2 to 4, Lord, teach us to pray. So we petition the Lord even to be generous. Lord, teach me to be generous. So what is this heart that I am going to take to the Lord? Am I going to take a large heart, as large as is possible for me? Or am I going to scrounge? Am I going to be miserly with the Lord? The more generous I am, the more large-hearted I am, the more the Lord can pour graces in my heart. The second quality is openness. And if there is an epitome of openness, if there is an exemplary example of openness, it is our Blessed Mother. Luke chapter 1 verse 38 summarizes for me what openness means in any situation. Let it be with me according to your word. This openness of Mary is so extraordinary that she wants the Lord to work in her. She does not say that she will cooperate with the Lord. She does not say that she will collaborate with the Lord. She does not say that she will join forces with the Lord or even network with the Lord. She doesn't say any of that. She asks the Lord to do in her. And that is an amazing response that we can give. And this attitude or the outcome of this attitude then becomes visible at the miracle at Cana. And she goes to her son at the miracle at Cana. No request is made of him. She doesn't ask him to come to the aid of the bridal party. She simply points the situation out to her son, they have no wine. John chapter 2, verse 3. They have no wine. And Jesus is harsh. There is no doubt about the fact that Jesus is harsh. Gunai ti emoi kai soi. Woman, what to me and to you? Why do you disturb me? Why do you come to me? Don't come in the way of me and my father. Literally, these are translations of this phrase. Woman, what to you and to me? Gunaiti emoi kai soi. But Mary is much bigger than taking a front. Mary is much bigger than being offended because her next words are not to Jesus. They are to the stewards and the words which we must keep hearing our mother tell us, do whatever he tells you. Now this, I believe, 
is the result of her openness and this is the result of our openness so we will keep doing whatever the lord tells us and so this openness if required and certainly required in a retreat i would like to believe we go to our blessed mother and ask for this grace because she received this grace like almost no one ever did and she shows us the extent to which we can be open the third quality is fearlessness my dear brothers we have made a number of retreats as jesuits over the years and not only in this day an age of instant communication of whatsapp and of mobile and of ipad and ipod and other kinds of things one of the greatest challenges that we have is to be alone is to be quiet it is easy for me to get involved in the ministry it's easy for me to get involved in the apostolate it's easy for me to keep on doing things you ask me to keep on doing things keep myself busy doing i'm very happy because when i'm doing then i don't need to sit down i don't need to think i don't need to reflect i don't need to be i don't need to be because if i only am if i am quiet if i go to my eremos if i go like jesus did to my desert place to my wilderness then i am afraid because the demons will catch up with me the demons of my failures the demons of my depression the demons of my despondency the demons of my weaknesses the demons of my frailty and i don't want to be seen as frail i don't want to be seen as weak i want to be seen as strong i want to be seen as an intellectual i want to be seen as a person who knows so to enter and to be quiet is not easy because in mark chapter 1 verses 12 and 13 when jesus is in the wilderness then we are told that the demons come and satan comes and he is tempted by satan matthew and luke matthew 4 1 to 11 Luke four one to thirteen will give us the details of the temptation, but Jesus remains. Jesus does not exit from the desert. He does not run away. And you and I, my brothers, can run away. And remember, we can run away to a book. we can run away to a video we can run away to our phones we can run away to our work we can run away to many things because we do not want to remain alone it's too frightening it's too frightening to remain alone who said ghost coming walking on the water and jesus is coming walking on the water mark chapter 6 verse 15 and he's saying to you tarsaiti meun phobiaste ego emi tarsaiti means courage take heart meun phobiaste do not be afraid i am i am and we are afraid because we are in this boat and the boat is rocking and the lord if the lord is present in our boat appears to be asleep and so we don't know what to do and we want to get out of the boat we want to jump into the sea we want to swim to the safety of the shore because we are so frightened 
Mark chapter 4, verses 40 to 41. Again there, the Lord says, after calming the wind and the storm with the word, he tells the disciples, he chides them almost. Why are you afraid? Often in the Gospels, the Lord himself exhorts to fearlessness. In the mission discourse of Matthew chapter 10, verses 26 to 31, the phrase, do not be afraid or do not fear, is used three times. In simply six verses, Matthew 10, 26 to 31, six verses, Jesus uses this phrase, either do not be afraid or do not fear three times. Nothing is uncovered, or rather nothing is covered that will not be uncovered. Do not fear those who can kill the body. You are worth more than many sparrows. Do not fear. <coughs> and so while it is true that in our desert, in our lonely place, in our wilderness, in our retreat. The demons may catch up with us. It is also true that there will be angels of hope. And this is a promise made by the Lord. The fourth quality I would like you to take to your retreat is the quality of perseverance. In Marathi, there is a word which explains what perseverance is so beautifully. It is chikati, chikati. And chikati is stickability. The translation is stick. Ani Marathi madhya apna manto, ekda dharla manje sodnar nai. So that is what perseverance means. Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8, gives us a beautiful, beautiful parable in perseverance. It is the parable of the widow and what is known as the unjust judge. And already when we are introduced to this judge, Jesus tells us he feared no one. He didn't have any regard for God or even for human beings. He did not fear about he did not fear anyone. And yet this widow who would have no male helper and so would be almost helpless is a perseverer. Is a woman chikati. She has the question, the quality of Chikari, she will never, never, never give up. In Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 30. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 to 28. Is a similar example of perseverance, though... The miracle is similar. They are narrated quite differently by the evangelists Mark and Matthew. In Mark, it is the Syrophoenician Gentile woman. In Matthew, she is named as a Canaanite woman. In Mark, the insult of Jesus is not as harsh as it is in Matthew. In Mark, Jesus says, let the children be fed first. It is not fair to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Let the children be fed first is an indication the dogs can eat later. In Matthew, there is no allowing the children to be fed first. There is no scope for the dogs to eat at all. Simply, it is not fair to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now notice, a lesser person would have given up. A lesser person would have taken offense. 
a lesser person would have been affronted and a lesser person would have said back to Jesus, if you do not want to help, do not help, but don't insult me. I'm a human being like you are. That's what a lesser person would have said. But this woman is extraordinary. This woman responds. This woman retorts. This woman is able to beat Jesus in the argument. So much so that Mark will say, for saying this, you may go. For saying this, that means you have beaten me in the argument. For saying this, you may go. Matthew, of course, will talk about faith. But the Mark in Jesus is willing to admit that the woman has beaten him. The woman's perseverance has won the day and so perseverance in Mark. In the Gospel of Luke again, when Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray, not only does he teach them how to pray, he also te teaches them about perseverance in prayer. So Luke chapter 11 verses 5 to 13, he gives the illustration of going to a friend at midnight for three loaves of bread or a favor. So we are going to God. And God says, now is not the time. And we persevere. And God says, now is not the time. And we persevere. And God says, now is not the time. And we persevere. And if it is God's will, then we get what we want. But, but we persevere. We do not know whether it is God's will or no. What we know is that we must persevere and not give up. In this example, I want to direct you to Matthew chapter 13 verses 45 to 46. That is a merchant in search of pine pearls. So we are in search of this pearl who is the Lord. And like that merchant in search of pine pearls, we are not going to give up until we find that pearl. And the fifth and final quality is that of silence. My dear brothers, I spoke about silence yesterday and I want to repeat silence today because I believe it is the only compulsory thing in a retreat. Your silence, both external and internal, is giving a message to the Lord and saying to the Lord that you want the Lord to make contact with you. You are telling the Lord that you want that the Lord reveal the Lord to you. You are telling the Lord through your silence that you want to be open. You want to be disponible. You want to hear the Lord. You want to experience the Lord. You want to encounter the Lord. And while silence is external and internal, what you need to do to understand the meaning of silence is remove the eye from the center. Remove the eye. And why do I say remove the eye? Because there is the danger that because you are in a position or in a place where you think you need to work, you will give the excuse of saying the work is calling you. You will give the excuse of the activity of something which cannot be kept till tomorrow, of something which has to be done, of them not being able to manage without you. This is why silence is not only the external and the internal, it is also the absence of self. If I think I am indispensable. If I think the ministry, the apostle, the place where I am cannot manage unless I make my presence felt, I think I'm fooling myself. And I say to every one of you, no matter who you are, 
no matter what position you hold, even if you were the general of the society, even if you were the Pope, I would say this to you. So please do not think that you have to be involved. No, if you're really serious, then you would make sure that you make the time for silence if you're making this retreat. Because keep this in mind, my brothers, there will always be things to be done, as Jesus says in Matthew chapter, Mark chapter 14, verses 3 to 9, when they shout at the woman, he says so beautifully that the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. I would like to interpret that statement in this context. The poor you will always have with you, so the work you will always have to do, the work will never stop, the work will never end. The work will go on. And if there's no work, you will find some work because you want to keep yourself busy. You will find some excuse because you want not to be by yourself. You're scared. Admit that you're scared. That's another story. You tell me, I'm scared. I can't really be. For years now, even as a Jesuit, I've not really been alone. And then you tell me, have the guts to tell me that. And I'll say, okay. But don't, don't tell me that your work is calling you. I cannot believe that. I'm sorry to say that. There is no work which you can not keep until you finish the retreat. So silence means I remove the I. There is no I if I remove the I. As long as the I is there, I will find it difficult to remain silent. Surely, surely, I will hear the talks. Oh, they are fantastic talks. What lovely talks. The content is great. Yes, I will hear the talks. But hearing the talks is hardly the point of a retreat, for God's sake. I mentioned to you that it is not I who am the director. The spirit must speak, and the spirit, while I would like to believe, the spirit speaks through me, but the spirit is speaking to you. And the spirit cannot speak to you if your ears, your heart, your eyes, and everything else is closed. And so therefore, my brothers, this is why I insist on silence. I requested you, if you remember, to tell those who are in contact with you or those you are engaged with in your work. And I request you to do that today. Tell them, see, really, if it is a tremendous emergency, then contact me. Otherwise, please do not. Those of you who, for some reason, because you imagine, which I don't believe, but because you imagine that you're in such a great position that you cannot keep your phone off, you have to keep your phone on, it's okay. I leave it to you. I leave it to you. You are mature enough to know that. But I would say you're not fooling me, and I do not know who else you're fooling. You're only fooling yourself. Keep that point in mind. So now we come to the second part of this talk, namely, how do I encounter the Christ who lives today? And in order to aid your encounter with this Christ who lives today, I'm going to suggest four ways, if you like. And the first is, you need to give all your time and your focus. In order to explain what your time and focus means, I point you out to Luke chapter 10, Verses 38 to 42. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. It is the beautiful story of Martha and Mary. Now, my brothers, these are two characters which you can identify with. And what is it? about these two characters. I think they're not simply Martha and Mary, but they are two dispositions which Luke is placing before us. And I would like to place before you, especially at the time of this retreat, placing these two dispositions. So what are the dispositions? On the surface level, it might seem that the disposition of Martha is to be active and engage in activity and that is correct but only at the surface level 
at the surface level, it might seem that the disposition of Mary is to be contemplative, is to be quiet, is to be silent, is to sit at the feet of the Lord, yes, but only at the surface level. Then how do we understand this text, Luke 10, 38 to 42, on the deeper level? On the deeper level, we look at what happens because of Mary's disposition of being engaged in activity, in work, in action. What kind of action is Mary's? Mary's action is what I call distracted action. And why do I call it distracted action? Because Mary's action ought to have had its focus on the action. Mary's action ought to have had its focus on what she was doing. But where is Mary's focus? Mary's focus is on the Lord. And Mary's focus is on her sister. Sorry, I'm Martha's focus, I mean. Martha's focus. Martha, who's the actor, where did Martha's focus ought to have been? It ought to have been on her action. Martha's focus ought to have been on what she was doing. Martha's focus ought to have been on her work. But Martha's focus is on the Lord and Martha's focus is on her sister Mary. Mary has not simply chosen contemplation, which she has done very beautifully and even dared to do as a woman to sit at the feet of a master. But Mary has chosen focused contemplation. So it is not simply sitting at the feet of the Lord. Yes, I can sit at the feet of the Lord for about an hour and then I get up and go and I get involved in my work. But Mary is focused so that Mary is not even aware of this anger of this animosity of her sister. She's so concentrated. She's so focused. So Martha's action is what I call distracted action. Mary's contemplation is what I call focused contemplation. So it is not merely that Jesus is making a distinction between saying, Martha, you have chosen action that is not as good as contemplation. No, no. What is the better part that Mary has chosen? Mary, the better part that Mary has chosen is the focus. In other words, Martha, if you had focused on your work, even that would be the better part when work has to be the focus. So in other words, the reason why I say time and focus, both, I include both, like I included generosity and large heartedness. Here I'm including time and focus. Time to give is one thing. I can be dancing in the, in the corridors. I can be walking in the garden. I can be looking at the trees and plants. And time passes by. But there's no focus at all. And what I want to point out to you, my brothers, is this sometimes has been our situation like Martha. We are working. We are engaged. We are active. We are in the ministry. We are in the apostolate. But what do we have to show for it? Nothing. We know today, in so many places in the city of Mumbai, and I'm sure this happens everywhere in our country and in many other parts of the world, people who are Catholic and Christian are sending their children to the schools of NGOs and others because they believe that the education they are getting there is much, much better. They are sending their children there because even in our schools, they're not even getting the values. So we say, no, but what about the values? They're getting better values there. Let me be very honest. And you will not believe this, but the fees which are charged by these NGOs and others who are also now into education is about 20 times more than we charge. 20 times, and they're willing to pay. 
they are willing to pay because very clearly somehow we seem to have lost our focus we are engaged in activity we are engaged in education we are teaching children we are teaching in colleges we have got our institutions but this is past glory that we are living on and now with this new nep things are going to change drastically they're going to change drastically and unless we respond as mary did with first focused contemplation and then our action will be concentrated action not distracted action then there is hope and i believe that there is hope because otherwise we are simply going to maintain the status quo and after some time our institutions will crumble there was a time when admission to st stanislaus to st xavier's i'm talking about our school st mary's before the forms for the junior kg or the kg were being given there would be such lines that we had to inform the police in advance so that they could maintain the bandobas outside they could maintain the law and order and there would be no fighting because we knew parents would come the previous evening to stand in line the forms were being given the next morning at 10 o'clock and by 6 in the evening of the previous day they were there waiting just to take a form when everyone would be given a form today there are some schools in which we have to invite people to come and take the form so jesus is not pointing us i believe to simply choose between contemplation and action no and he is not even saying that contemplation is better than action when he says that mary has chosen the better part what he's saying actually is that if we are contemplating then our contemplation has to be focused if we are acting our acting has to be focused but if i am acting and my mind is on contemplation then like martha my mind is going to be on the lord and my mind is going to be on my sister on others who are not doing as much as i am doing and there are many of us who because we are busy 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 think that we are doing more than others that's not true that is not true in the bombay province catalog there are some of our jesuits who were very very actively involved in the past but now because of age and other ailments cannot be involved they are in the infirmary in a variety of places and i insisted that at the side of every of their names it should be put praise for the church and the society so this jesuit is not merely in the infirmary what is he doing there you and i would say he is sick or he is old or he is an invalid and i say at the side of his name put praise for the church and the society so every one of us whether we are in inverted commas actively involved let us say teaching a ministry or we are in social work or we are in mahila mandalas or we are in other kind of work are engaged and we are as engaged as they are this is what jesus means by the better part there is no better or not better no the better part is you do what you are doing and the motto of john berkman's i think summarizes what jesus means when he says better part RJ quod argis so when i'm working i am working when i'm praying i am praying this is what mary realized but martha did not and that's why jesus had got to correct martha and notice if we like martha are involved in distracted action you know what is the consequence you would tell jesus what to do you see the reaction of martha she presumes to tell jesus what to do Mary, because her concentration and focus will have Jesus tell her what to do, like our Blessed Mother. 
do whatever he tells you. The second point I would like you to take for your reflection, my brothers, is the question which Jesus asks in the Synoptic Gospels, who do you say that I am? All the three Synoptic Gospels have this question of Jesus. And th this question is after Jesus asks a previous question, namely, who do people say that I am? And what is interesting to note is this, that in all the Gospels, the answer of the people are different from the answer of the disciples. The people see Jesus as John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets or one of the old prophets or one of the ancient prophets. In all the three synoptic gospels, Mark chapter 8 verse 29, Matthew chapter 16 verse 15 and Luke chapter 9 verse 20. In all the three synoptic gospels, Peter as the spokesperson of the disciples answers, even though Jesus does not only ask Peter, the you is plural. And this is how the question is asked, who may stay? And it should be translated in this manner, but you, he said to them, who do you say I am? That's the literal translation. You, he said to them, who do you say I am? In other words, I'm asking you now this group of 12. I'm asking you now this company of Jesus, this company of Jesus, this society of Jesus. I'm asking you. And a short reflection, a very short reflection will enable you to realize that you do not know that you do not know. And why do I say you do not know yet? I hope it's only yet. Because the answer is you are the Christ. That's Peter's answer in the Gospel of Mark. You are the Christ, the son of the living God, is Peter's answer in the Gospel of Matthew. You are the Christ of God, is Peter's answer in the Gospel of Luke. And you will say, but my answer is you are my brother. You are my friend. You are my companion. They're all cliches. Those are cliches. And sometimes, because we want to be inclusive, and we think we are being inclusive, and we are being revolutionary, God, my father and my mother. That's how we relate with God. But I tell you, you're celebrating mass, or you're celebrating a, a service for a group of orphans. Then the orphans don't have father and mother. So what do you mean by God, my father and my mother? So we see, for me, even Jesus even this Christ is a sort of metaphor. What term do I use? Peter's answer is Peter's answer because that was his experience, whatever it may have been. And the disciple may have agreed with him. And what I want to point out to you is this, that the answer of the people is different because the disciples have been so close to him. And now today, the answer, the experience of people and in most cases, whom we consider very, very simple people, in my opinion, in my experience, is much, much deeper than ours. Because our experience, including mine, has often been an intellectual. We can make prayers. And we can give homilies. And we can give talks. And all of that is so easy. But all that is like the seed which falls on the path or the rocky ground or among thorns. That is how it is. It does not impact anybody because it is coming from here, the head. And so, my brothers, I would like you to hear the Lord 
ask you this question. Who do you say that I am? Think about it for a moment. Who is this Lord for you? The larger majority of the times when you make your prayer, how do you address the Lord? I said twice earlier that we believe in a personal God, so there is absolutely no reason whatever that we should not be able to have this personal name for the Lord. And your relationship will reveal your name. If you keep on using the cliches which have been used by others, if you keep on using the terms and names used by others, it is very, very likely that the Lord you have not met at all. And now is a chance to meet him. So now meet him. The third, my brothers, is a question which I think is similar to who do you say that I am. But in the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verse 15. This question is asked specifically to Peter. Do you love me? Agapas me. Do you love me? Then we reflect on these two questions. And both of which are answered by Peter, even though the first one is asked to all the disciples. What we realize is this. That these questions have nothing to do with Peter's qualities, with Peter's talents, with Peter's gifts. They have to do with Peter's relationship with the Lord. They have to do with how Peter sees and encounters the Lord. And we know Peter was appointed the head at least in the Gospel of Matthew, very clearly, Matthew 16, 16 to 19, Peter is given the keys of the kingdom. So very clearly, and even in the Acts of the Apostles in the early church, we see that Peter was, in a way, the leader. So before appointing Peter as the leader, these are two questions. And both the questions focus on the relationship. How does Peter view the Lord? How does Peter encounter the Lord? How does Peter meet the Lord? And so, my brothers, I want you to hear this question also as addressed to you. Agapas me. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. It's not your answer. That's Peter's answer. Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. That's Peter's answer. Go into the depth of your being. Bother less, as Meister Eckhart says, bother less about what you ought to do and think more about what you ought to be. And the last point, my brothers, is faith. There are a variety of definitions of faith in scripture. But the one which I think brings out the meaning very beautifully is the one found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, where the author says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So there are four aspects there. First is assurance. Thing, second is hoped for. Third is conviction. And fourth is unseen, not seen. If you take these four together, you will realize beautifully what faith is. And you ask yourself whether you have that faith. It might help to read Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 to 6, the example of Abram. Abram, the name, is God 
is my father Abram. And this Abram and his wife Sarah, who were both childless, who had no progeny, who had no land, is promised by God the two things that he does not have and seems no hope of having. And we know, what did Abraham do? Abraham believed God's promises and because he believed God's promises, he became Abraham. That is a father of a multitude. So he received both progeny and he received land. Further than the eye could see and progeny as numerous as the grains of sand in the seashore, as numerous as the stars in the sky. In Mark chapter 11, verses 22 to 25, on the lips of Jesus is the definition of both prayer and faith combined. Mark 11, 22 to 25. When Jesus says there, when you pray, believe that you have received already what you are praying for and it will be yours. So to believe in advance. So I want to encounter the Lord. I believe in my heart that I am going to encounter him. I am going to meet him. And I'm going to persevere like the widow who persevered with the judge. I'm going to persevere like the Syrophoenician woman who persevered with Jesus. I am going to remain open like our blessed mother. And I'm going to respond as much as I can by saying, let it be done to me according to your word.